the 40th anniversary of the reform and opening up policy this year. In an increasingly globalized world, what new economic and social challenges is China faced with? And our special Spring Festival series, Speaking Volumes, continues with more must-read books. Welcome to The Point. From Beijing, Andy Xin. Twenty-one years ago today, the primary architect of China's reform and opening up, Deng Xiaoping, passed away. This year also marks the 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening up strategy. Over the past four decades, China has seen dramatic changes in almost every facet of its economy, society and international relations. A nation that was once seen as on the brink of collapse has become a significant player on the global stage. How do we evaluate Deng Xiaoping's legacy and why is reform ending opening up viewed as China's turning point in history and what are the new tasks for this nation today? Joining me for the discussion are Charles Liu, the founder of How Capital and Yi Ming, chief advisor of MTR China Business. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Mr. Liu, 40 years ago, you started your business interaction with China, if I understand correctly. What was China like back then? In other words, the backdrop of China's reform and opening up. My first visit to the People's Republic of China, to the mainland, was exactly 40 years ago, a month. Wow. So a month. Where did you go? Um, it wasn't easy getting here. Uh, coming from New York, it was New York to Hong Kong. Hong Kong taking a train for two and a half days to Beijing. So it was Beijing and uh, Nanjing, where I had some relatives. Mm -hmm and then to the north where it was really, really cold. Mm. Um, I was at that time doing projects for the United Nations, development projects in Africa and in South America. And I have to say, there was no difference in terms of the living conditions, in terms of the circumstances, in terms of the food even. It was just like the countries of Africa. So for me, I, I get quite emotional thinking about what has happened over the last 40 years. Mm. I remember coming to, before coming to China, it was India. At that time, per capita GDP of China was one dollar more than per capita GDP of India. Today is 500 percent that of India. Right. So, so why was reform and opening up crucial for China back then? Uh, if China did not open up, did not reform, did not take a new tack, um, the country was in serious trouble, mm -hmm. really serious trouble. I think uh, you have a large population that has to be fed, that has to be closed, and there was nothing. There was no material basics that was available to the masses. Mr. Yi, your memory of the, uh, those times, uh, 40 years ago? 40 years ago, my mother was struggling to use the uh, food coupon and the industrial products coupon, if you uh, do you understand what I mean, the coupon the here. Rations, the rations, the right. tickets. You have right. to buy stuff, use the coupon. Actually, uh, I was struggling to buy my first bicycle <laughs> because there is no product coupon, I couldn't buy it. Mm -hmm. Well, without the opening up and reform, um, do you think China would have survived? Chinese economy would have developed, Mr. E? No, I don't think so. Uh, with the big population and also uh, with the uh, uh, very less supply and demand growing, I cannot even believe, you know, how do we uh, survive until today. Well, Deng Xiaoping is, is regarded as the great architect of China's reform and opening up. He's also appreciated as kind of a, steals, a steersman of the nation. How do you look at the role of Deng Xiaoping? Forty years ago, did you have any idea what he was going to launch? Um, he must have thought about this quite a lot. and He must have had very, very wise people with him. Because what he did was to, the reform and opening up was to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit and the energy of the Chinese population to improve their lives, to do something that would benefit the whole country. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, ultimately is the most important driver of the reform and opening up, namely the entrepreneurial spirit, 
and the hard work of the Chinese population. Mm -hmm. Well, China just came out of 10 years of uh, political turmoil, mm -hmm. which we all understand very well. How was he able to do that, to unleash the spirit of innovation, of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, Mr. Yi, from your understanding? From my understanding, I think uh, China has been uh, gone through uh, four stages. First one, I would say the uh, you know the in infrastructure uh, development. The second one, industrialization. Third one, I would say the innovation. I would looking for the uh, last one, inclusion. More inclusion would be uh, you know what we are looking for in the future mm -hmm. uh, to have more different uh, reform. That's something uh, we're looking for. Right, but uh, while Deng Xiaoping initiated the reform and opening up, which stage we were in then? Were, were there already the basis of the infrastructure for China to embark on economic uh, development? Well, uh, if you look at you know the whole reforming uh, process, I would say first of all they resolve the uh, poverty issue. The poverty population from 700 million down to uh, 40 million today. And in the 19th uh, NPC uh, uh, report, it's talking about you know in 2020, uh, there will be uh, you know all resolved, all eliminated. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing I would say the mobility. You know we have more choices today. The mobility for people, you know, make uh, a lot of choice. Well, talking about mobility, um, there are concerns that the Chinese society is uh, increasingly in the lack of social mobility, uh, meaning it is more and more difficult for people to mo move between the different socials, the social hierarchies through their hard work. Is that the reality? I would say uh, mobility, you know, the, uh, we have more mobility compared to 40 years ago. For instance, today, you know, we have more uh, peasant people, you know, they are working in the city, the urbanization process in the last 10 years. It's a huge. And also we have a big contribution to the whole world. Uh, the mobility, what I mean the horizontal mobility, which means uh, transportation like high-speed train, like more uh, transportation tools available today. What I mean, transportation can improve people's communication, change people's mindset, change people even the viewpoint. So I believe the mobility in China is large, big so contribution. So there is. So why do people talk about this kind of social immobility? Saying, for instance, if you are born into a, a poor family, the chances that you rise up in society is less. Is that the well, reality? I, now? I think that's absolutely false. It's, it's not the case at all, because as as uh, as you just said, there's no question that how many people have gone to work in the cities from farms, and that's already a change of social strata. You you go from tilling the land to work on construction sites or work in factories. That's already social mobility, and it's been a massive transformation of social strata in China. Um, where you have now over 50 percent of the population living in urban centers, from 20 some percent. Mm -hmm. In it's just a matter of uh, 20, 30 years, years. Yes. exactly. So how could anyone claim that there's no social mobility? And not only that, what about all the startup businesses, all those who are sort of changye, mm -hmm. to create your own business? So many young people are doing that. You talk about social mobility. Jack Ma was an English school teacher and became what he is today over the course of, of over less than 15 years. Mm -hmm. So that's social mobility as well. However, there is the concern, and I often read about it as well in my social media, for instance, people would post this kind of um, articles about it is more and more difficult. For instance, in the past, someone, if they, if they want to leave their countryside, what they have to do is to study hard, go into a good university in the big city, and your life will be changed forever, because then you have the opportunity to find a good job in the big city, and your life will, you can bring the rest of your fam family from the countryside to the big cities, for instance. <laughs> is that more difficult now? Yeah, it does that reflect a, a big social problem? I don't think it's, it's a social issue. I think it's a question of how the economic structure has changed. The structure of the economy has changed. Where increasingly, with more sophisticated business sectors, the requirement in terms of information, knowledge, education is becoming harder and harder. 
it, it's more demanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those who don't have the right education or who didn't study the right subjects, it's uh, difficult to fill certain job roles. So it's, it's, a, it's a change in the structure of the economy where the Chinese economy is becoming much more elaborate, much more sophisticated, and the supply chain is becoming global, in fact. So you can't blame uh, this on, you know, the economy on social factors. Mr. E, And also okay? today, if you look at the, uh, the more fairness uh, system, I still would say the uh, national exam. You know, people, you can go to the national mm -hmm. exam going to the university, you have the career start from uh, zero, okay? That's the only one maybe uh, we have more. But compared to the 40 years ago, uh, Deng Xiaoping just called this, you know, uh, national exam, you know. That's, you know, change a lot of people's uh, life. Give people the opportunity right. to go into university and, mm -hmm. and, and start. And blossom and blossom. That's right. Right. Well, uh, Deng Xiaoping really had many, many golden sentences, let's say, uh, in the Chinese people's minds, for instance, another very famous sentence that he said about prosperity. He said, let a small group of people get rich first, and then eventually the people of, of China would have their collective prosperity. However, um, if you look at the Gini coefficient, for instance, is actually quite high, although the trend, the growth trend in recent years has been stable, even going down a little bit. But the absolute number has always been 0 0.47, 0 0.46. Some people are saying if it is over <coughs> 0 0.4, that shows the society has a very big uh, gap between the rich and poor. Charles, how oh, do you look I, at this? I, I say that a lot of these Western um, coefficients or indicators or benchmarks uh, really don't apply to China because what we did in the last 30 years, 40 years actually, really in the last 25 to 30 years, as you said, lifting 700 million people out of poverty, that in itself is uh, a task which is unrivaled in human history. And then more than that, um, there are other ways of calculating wealth. Um, you must have seen the report that 10% of all state-owned assets, the shares of all state-owned assets, have gone into Social Security. SOEs own a lot of assets. 10% mm -hmm. we're talking about trillions. And this is now going into the population. And these are things which are occurring which don't figure into their calculation of Gini coefficient. Um, because ultimately, state-owned assets are owned by the population. And this is why you can have this transfer. The second part, which is very important, is the rapid pace of transformation. The change in China is so quick. Mm. A lot of the benchmarks of Western countries are based on very mature, not changing societies, mm. as we've seen in China. So looking ahead, looking ahead, what do you think is the next big challenge in China's road towards reform and opening up, Mr. E? I, I would say uh, another word, uh, inclusive. So inclusion, uh, you know, uh, lead China to be more inclu inclusive by the whole world, outside world, and also include more sort of uh, different views, uh, different, you know, lifestyles, and also uh, uh, education more fairness. Mm -hmm. What I mean education more fairness, this is exactly what you are talking about. Maybe, you know, the vertical so-called uh, mobilization, the issues. I think that's a more challenge. That's why the 19th uh, NPC uh, Congress mentioned the deepened reform. Right. Political reform, educational reform. So definitely the trend is going on and China will have to go through deeper reform. Charles, 40 years after you've been in China, if there is one thing that you think China need to tackle and right now, what would it be? Well, I think it's being tackled now. That's the environment. Water, air, mm -hmm. and soil. Uh, it's, it's a very heavy payment that the Chinese have made mm -hmm. to accelerate their growth rate to what it is today. But it's absolutely amazing what the government, when it decides to really e execute uh, what they can do. And I can see that happening. The environment is being treated uh, 
Huh. Seriously. Sure. Let's hope that the blue skies we've been enjoying in Beijing will last. Will stay. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Many thanks to my two guests, Charles Liu, the founder of How Capital and Yi Ming, chief advisor of MTR China Business. And you have been watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. I'll take a short break and I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Welcome to Speaking Volumes, The Point's special 2018 Spring Festival program. During this special series, we have been inviting guests to come and share with us their favorite book. Each one of them will be starting by uh, reading a few lines from their book before we move into discussions. And joining me today are Wang Yue, Alibaba Cloud Research Institute strategy expert, and Alan Babington Smith, president of the Royal Asiatic Society. Society in Beijing. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, happy Chinese Spring Festival. <laughs> what are the, um, the thoughts and, and why you're recommending the, this particular book? Um, Mr. Babington Smith, why don't you start first? Um, one of the, the topics I think we were going to touch on, apart from Chunjie, was uh, science fiction and fantasy. And uh, I chose a book called Foundation. And uh, it, it seemed to me very relevant because Chunjie is one of the real surviving daily foundations of Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. It's one of the festivals that is a foundation of every family's life in China. And so this book, which is what I read f first when I was at school, uh, is called Foundation, and it's the start of a series of science fiction books by an American called Asimov, who was the grandfather of all science fiction writing, in a sense. And I thought I might uh, start by just reading some passages from it. Uh, remember, this book was written in 1953, so before anybody you know was born. <laughs> There were nearly 25 million inhabited planets in the galaxy, and they all owed allegiance to the Empire. For Gale, a young man in the story, this trip was the undoubted climax of his young scholarly life. He had travelled previously only so far as a single satellite in order to get data on the mechanics of meteor driftage, which he needed for his dissertation. But space travel was all the same, whether you traveled half a million miles or half a million light years. He had steeled himself just a little for the jump through hyperspace, a phenomenon one didn't experience. The jump remained and would probably remain forever the only practical method of jumping between the stars. So here is somebody writing in 1953 before even a man had gone into space. Mm -hmm. And he is talking about traveling between 25 million inhabited planets. Mm -hmm. it's, about it's extraordinary the, vision. Yeah, about star hopping. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, your impression. Have you read it before? No. No. Yeah. What do you? What, what is your first impression mm -hmm. upon hearing it? Um, yes, I think at that time uh, we have no uh, we have no such uh, advanced technologies, so it's hard to imagine uh, the author. They have uh, a lot of imagination and uh, creativities, but I think uh, those uh, imagination uh, will sooner or later come true. And uh, you can see that uh, now we have already uh, we are already capable of going to the other planets. So who can knows uh, in uh, ten years or 20 years uh, in the future, uh, we can uh, fly to the, the other planets in the solar system. So, yeah. Yeah. because we, uh, the people is uh, uh, always underestimated what's going to happen in the future. So if we're looking uh, for the next 20 years or 30 years, there'll be um, a dramatic change. Mm -hmm. Mr. Babington Smith. Well, I think one of the intriguing things is that, as somebody once said about the universe, mm -hmm. it's not 
just stranger than we imagine, but it is stranger than we can imagine. And you know, Sien Tseng Li will get you so far, but trying to think of something that is beyond what you can imagine is, is going to be the fascinating thing. And he had the imagination to think of this, but there are things already have happened that are stranger than he could ever have imagined. So it, it's, that's what's interesting to me about science fiction, is where it goes beyond what ordinary people imagine into what you cannot imagine. What do you think is the, is the main difference between his work and, and basically my question is why do you think he's so great compared to the many other science fiction writers we've had and especially uh, in, you know, in today's world where you know, the imagination is supposed to be even wilder you know, because you have all of these technologies that are just showing up at an even faster spe speed. Well, what, what in, intrigues me from what I've read of contemporary Chinese science fiction and fantasy um, is that a lot of them seem to create, imagine, um, what I would call dystopias, worlds where things are not working right. Dystopias, yes. yes. They're not so much about the conventional idea of contact with aliens, though, of course, the three-body problem is about aliens conquering the world and how you deal with that. But most of it seems to me to be creating a world which is one way or another um, unhappy. I mean, if you think of Hao Jing Fang's book about the invisible planets, in most of those, uh, the world is not working. Or There's amnesia, right. people don't have a sense of self, uh, they ask the question, what is the truth? All very important questions. Or maybe a lot of social problems that we're experiencing today being integrated into the sci-fi works. Well, I'm glad you said that. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't like to say that. Mm. But I think it is. It's more interesting as a social commentary mm. than as real science fiction. I mean, they aren't inventing new means of traveling about space or new gadgets or, or whatever. I think it's a very interesting aspect of, of science fiction. Absolutely. With, in old, I mean, in, it's not a new aspect entirely because one of the most similar books to that in Western literature is a book called Gulliver's Travels. Do mm -hmm. you know of course. about this man who travels and sees these strange worlds? They weren't planets, of course, they were different parts of planet Earth where people behave in very strange ways. They're very small or they're very big or they have strange beliefs. And it seems to be very similar to that, which was written as a kind of satire on, on contemporary Britain mm. 250 years ago. And it seems to me that a lot of the science fiction that I've read is in a similar way, a kind of satire. Mm. But different from, from what, we are, what you have recommended. Exactly, yeah. exactly. This is all... A lot of this is about politics in an outer space. There's empires fighting. What's the relevance for today's world, yeah. then, if it is not so closely connected to one particular society? Or maybe simply because of that, because of the irrelevance to any particular uh, human environment, that it makes everybody, you know, wants to read about it. Well, I think that's a fascinating point you raise. And the huge success of the three-body problem in the States and of... Chinese science fiction generally uh, is culturally I think very very important because it's the first Chinese literature that is readily acceptable and understandable mm. to people in the West. I mean the great Chinese literature, the Wang, uh, you know, the Tang Dynasty poems or whatever are not really mm. understandable in, in the West. And at I mean, this time... But this, the, this the new Chinese science fiction I think is, and it's a fascinating new cultural bridge. No. Uh, so I think it's fascinating. But I, I see you also brought other books, and uh, The Odyssey of Homer. Um, yeah. What's the connection there? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, this book is called Foundation, but The, the, the Odyssey of Homer is the, fa is the foundation, <laughs> exactly. Quite right. Why do you say that? Well, it's the foundation. It's a personal foundation for me, and it's a, it is the foundation of all, almost all Western literature. 
this and its companion book, the Iliad, but it's also written by Homer, uh, are the foundations of almost all Western literature. Why do you think it's important that you remind, that you, we, we revisit it now? Partly because I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important to me on this topic because it was uh, a foundation of my life. You know, I, I think we're going to hear when we, you talk about your book, it was one thing you read as a child and so on, and inspired your imagination. Yeah. This was the book that, that was read to me and I read as a child. Mm. And so it has inspired a lot of my thinking in life. And it is also full of almost science fiction or fantasy stories. I mean, I'm sure you know that the hero Ulysses, Ulysses meets all sorts of strange creatures who do strange things. Right. And he traveled to what was the edge of the known world yeah. in, his, in, in the story. So he was almost exploring outer space. Absolutely. Written there's the time. connection. So there's Did the connection. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Please go ahead May and I read, read this, a paragraph. A bit, um, there's a, this is a, a passage where Ulysses has to avoid two terrible dangers. So we sailed up the narrow strait in fear. On one side was Scylla, and on the other side was shining Charybdis, who made her terrible ebb and flow of the sea's water. When she vomited it up like a cauldron over a strong fire, the whole sea would boil up in turbulence, and the foam flying spattered the spinnacles of the rocks in either direction. But when in turn she sucked down the sea's salt water, the turbulence showed all the inner sea and the rock around it grown terribly, and the ground showed up at the sea's bottom. With fear of destruction, we kept our eyes on Charybdis. But meanwhile, Scylla, out of the hollow vessel, snatched six of my companions, the best of them for strength and hands work. And when I turned to look at the ship with my other companions, I saw their feet and hands from below, already lifted high above me, and they cried out to me and called me by name the last time they ever did it in heart sorrow. I saw them gasping and struggling, gasping and struggling as they were hoisted up the cliff. Right in her doorway, Scylla ate them up. They were screaming and reaching out their hands to me in this horrid encounter. Thank you, thank you. Well, very w vivid, it's as vivid, if the battle scene, yeah. Exactly, and, and you know, science fiction is, is full of horrid beasts doing horrid things. And, and this, is, this is just one episode of, of several in the book. It's fascinating that uh, um, throughout human history, we have always, um, we were always fascinated by what we didn't know on the edge of our knowledge and trying to imagine the unknown and and how we would interact if we really stand in front of them. And that's probably going to lead us to explore the future and push our boundaries. I hope so. I hope that, I mean, I don't know who amongst uh, the rulers of the world reads science fiction. <laughs> but perhaps it's <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> it's the nature of human being to discover the unknown war more. Anyway, we always need to keep our imagination open, right? Absolutely. That's the beauty yeah. of life. This shows all the possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Many thanks to um, Alan Babinson Smith, president of the Royal Asiatic Society in Beijing. And uh, you have been watching a special edition of The Point, speaking volumes. Uh, stay tuned for our guest Wang Yue from Alibaba Cloud Research Institute to, to share his book in the next episode. Meanwhile, download the application called CGTN to watch our show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and check out CGTN The Point. Thanks again to the third space leader, Ariel Space, to provide the site support and many thanks to our audience for being with us.